throughout our lives, we are constantly absorbing new information. We are redefining and rearranging our values and ideas based on what we learn and how important that information is to us. When I was 12, my biggest worry was if the shorts I brought for gym class were going to break dress code. The information I had at the time fit my 12-year-old self. My ideas were simple, just like my life was simple. Now I'm 20, and compared to the simplicity and confidence I had when I was 12, I don't know who I am or where I'm going. What was important to me then is no longer important to me now, as the people and places and knowledge in my life have changed. We all go through major events or experiences in our lives and come out a bit differently. This is easily seen with big things like love or leaving home. But I would even go as far to say that the little things change us too. A small conversation with a friend or the latest lecture from one of our classes. Our ideas are in a flux. We are constantly adapting to socially challenging environments and new people in our lives. And for us college students, this is always happening, as we're in an environment full of new people, places, and the ability to change who we are at an instant. We live and breathe in a larger-than-life feeling. A week can feel like a month, and a month can feel like a year, because so many new experiences are crammed into it. It's as if our eyes keep changing, and we have to constantly update our glasses prescription. But because our vision is changing so rapidly, we can never really see clearly. Often, we are unconscious of these changes, slumberly drifting through each day, eyes half closed. But I want to challenge us to wake up and acknowledge these changes in our vision. I plan on discussing these changes of sight, the evolving lens we project to the world, in two ways. First, with knowledge that broadens our vision, pushing us to see beyond what we know and expanding the values we live by. And second, with knowledge that narrows our vision, pushing us to focus on what's right in front of us. The first era of change is how our vision can be broadened to see beyond what we know. This is done in moments of discomfort, when we are literally thrust into new situations that we never could have prepared for. These force us to learn as we go, to act as our vision is rapidly changing before us. And not only does our vision change, but our ideas about who we are and the world we live in change along with them. There were two big shifts in my life when I experienced this vision broadening. By the time I transferred to William and Mary, I lived in two other countries on my own as a student. Being from a small rural Virginia town, I never thought this would be possible, and certainly not before I turned 20. I didn't live abroad because my parents were diplomats in the military, or even because they liked traveling. I lived abroad because I wanted to, because I wanted to learn new languages and meet people who had been so much further than myself. And in doing so, I was able to go so much farther than I ever thought possible. When I was 16, I was awarded the National Security Language Initiative Scholarship for Youth to study Arabic in Rabat, Morocco. This is my Arabic class. I was there to learn the language, and so I arrived with little knowledge of any of the local languages. I was in this constant state of disorientation and readjustment as I was pushing myself to engage day and night. I remember the long, very late night conversations at the beginning of my stay during Ramadan with easily over 30 family members in one room. And the only words I could pick out were Amrikia and Inglesia, America and English. I suddenly saw myself in this new light, one where I was struggling to understand. Being seen as a natural part of society was no longer a given for me, and I was learning through the mistakes I made daily. Once, I mixed up the words for left and right and got completely lost with my taxi driver on the way home. In the US, I was a confident young woman who could speak to anyone, and her words would be backed up by educated opinions and worthy ideas. Here, I was a foreigner, a foreigner who didn't belong, who, in a restaurant, was either dressed in English or French or not at all, who it was assumed could neither say anything nor had anything worth listening to. I wasn't from Morocco. I didn't speak flawless Arabic. What the hell did I know? Did I know that this jersey being sold to me 
had misspelled the names of the national Moroccan soccer team and that I was being outrageously overcharged? No. Did I buy it for my brother? Yeah. Of course, as I continued to study Arabic and had more interactions with Moroccans, I became a more confident speaker. But it was this process of having to learn that confidence, to build myself back up again, that opened my eyes to a new reflection of who I was and who I could be. It was this constant state of readjustment that I had to live in that broadened my vision to a new way of seeing the world and myself in it. When I was 18, I enrolled as a first year student at the Paris Institute of Political Studies, Sciences Po, and moved to Monton, France. This would require me to change the gears of my vision once more, not because the language or the culture was a barrier, but this time, it was the sheer amount of diversity in ideas and beliefs in one room. Students argued fiercely with the ideology of their backgrounds and found strength in their differences from everyone else. It didn't feel like we were all grasping for the same attention or flaunting similar accomplishments, but rather using our distinct histories to make arguments for what we believed in. It was awe-inspiring and intimidating at the same time. Looking outwards, in my Arab civilizations class, we had students from all over the Middle East, from Iran, Iraq, Morocco, Palestine, Israel, who all had experiences and well-educated opinions that I could never have. They criticized governments and religions they'd grown up in, referenced history I'd never learned about in school. Looking inwards, in my Arab politics class, when we discussed the actions of the American government, the gaze would shift to the American students in the room as if we had to take responsibility for a nation's actions or mistakes. There was a wealth in information and diversity that came from having students from everywhere. But there was also a sense of representation that was pushed upon you as being one of the only or one of the few citizens of that country in the room. I began to question my identity as a citizen and a student as a result of this pressure. We all had such different perspectives on who we were as people, students, citizens, but we are all students of France. There was rarely agreement in the room, but what we shared was our desire to discuss and challenge each other to try and change our respective visions, to shift our perspectives in ways we could never do on our own. I was constantly being shoved into all the histories and opinions in the room. What we had in common was our desire to learn and grow out of the previous prescription of our world lenses. I began to see others no longer as clusters of accomplishments, but rather as individuals with their own unique ideas and histories. In a university environment where we are so often valued by our marks, our grades, our resumes, treated like work output machines, this can easily be forgotten. My experiences and ideas were challenged by being surrounded by those who lived such different lives from my own. These vision broadening experiences in Morocco and France opened my eyes to new ways of seeing the world and myself in that world. The second era of change is how our vision can be narrowed to see what's right in front of us in completely new ways. The easiest way to notice if your vision has shifted is to ask yourself, what do I see when I look right in front of me? We can even do this right now. Look at the people around you, or rather, Look wherever you look to see people during a pandemic. Six feet away, out the window, in the little Zoom squares. Who do you see and who do you not see? Perhaps you'll see some friends, uh, some people you vaguely know. The rest, who knows? Think about how this would have changed had you looked around this room a year ago. The ability to name who or what you see gives you this power of recognition. And so you have confidence in that knowledge. You don't really have to look around you because you can already name who is or isn't there. The ability to name sees things for you. I first began to notice this vision shift when I studied figure drawing here at William and Mary. We studied anatomy in the course, and so I was soon able to name the things that made up the body, the structure, the bones, the muscles, the tendons. These things had always been there, but they had been hidden from me because I couldn't see them. And so once I was able to name them, that allowed me to see a lot more. However, this naming can also become limiting 
as we become comfortable in seeing only what we can name. And so, if you can only see the people who, who you can name, how can you see anyone else? Look at how much more this face is telling us than the last. There's a new kind of complexity here, and there are more parts that we can pick out and name. And so since we can name more parts of it, we seem to feel that we can see more. We can look beyond this naming by realizing that there are different ways to look at something according to what we want to see. If I want to recreate the structure of a face, I'll look for the things that make it and the names that go along with that. If I want to recreate the color of a face, however, I'll look for the colors that compose it and the relationships they have with each other. I, as we all do, have selective vision. I look around me according to what I want to see, to what I know I'll see, to what I expect to see. Just as you all looked around this room today, according to who you thought would be there. Now look at how different this face is from the last. We're not seeing the structure, we're not seeing parts we can name, because that's not the focus here. The focus is the color and the relationships between those colors. We can see how the coolness in the blue of the mask contrasts with the background, or how the different shades underneath the chin create shadow. It's just a face like the last one, but this face required a completely different way of looking and a completely different era of sight. We see what's important to us, and this often means seeing only what we know. As we begin to organize and name what we see around us, we stop looking for more. And so we must constantly strain our eyes to look, to look at what's familiar and unfamiliar. This isn't to say that if you never study figure drawing or move to another country that you won't experience these changes of sight. Sure, moving to another country may change your vision dramatically, but I would say that our vision changes daily. I saw tulips by the library yesterday and now they're covered in snow. I met someone for coffee who I didn't know a year ago. I would challenge us to think about how often our vision really changes. And especially as college students, sometimes campus can feel as strange and different and exciting as a foreign country, brimming with experiences we've yet to have or people we've yet to meet. You might also think, sure, this vision shift affects how I see others or the world or these things in front of me, but how does it affect how I see myself? This talk is just about places I never want to go or dumb art classes. What does this have to do with me? Yes, these vision shifts do affect how we see others or the world or these things in front of us. But they also affect how we see ourselves in that world and interacting with those people. And it's the ideas that come from this vision shift that tell us the most about who we are. Each vision shift opens up a new era of sight in our lives. As I learned more and had more different experiences, I gained this new ability of sight. This knowledge broadened my vision to new ways of seeing the world and myself in it, and narrowed my vision to new ways of seeing what was right in front of me and what had always been there. I want you to walk away from this today, not thinking about how you could change your vision or where you should go to do so, but rather how your vision has already changed in all the different areas of sight in your life. Thank you.